How many of you uh, love the worship in this house? I, I just love the worship in this house. It prepares the ground. It prepares our hearts for the word. It prepares, you know, our ears. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason why I'm more appreciative now, I'm always appreciative for the presence of God and for the move of God and the spirit of God is that uh, this message for us today is something that is probably not a woohoo message, you know, but I believe it's something that we all need, that all of us need. And um, coming from uh, Pastor Stephen's message last Sunday, so powerful. Let's talk about pride. And he talked about the sin pride, all right? Obviously, when we say pride right now, there's a lot of other things that we think about. But Pastor Stephen was talking about pride, the sin, pride, what the Bible calls sin. And he said this in his message, uh, which I want us to all repeat right now. He said this message, his message last week, is for all of us, not just some of us. And so today, before I start, we will all declare this, all right? This message is for all of us. Not just some of us. Amen. So I want to keep that in mind. Because as I was preparing for this message, this message was first for me. And of course, going through the message, the next thing I said was like, Lord, why me? Because <laughs> you know, you're the first person who gets like, ah. Oh. And uh, so I want to start with this. I want to start my message with a loaded question. And it's found in Luke chapter 6. Verse 46, again, coming out, you know, of last Sunday's message. And the verse is this. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? It hits a little harder now because we just sang. <laughs> he is Lord. He's my Lord. I'm right there singing that. You're my Lord. I'm going, oh, my gosh. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Now, that hits home. It, was anybody hit right now, or is it just me? It hits home, especially after singing that beautiful, glorious song, which rightly so we sing. I'm not saying let's never sing that, because we're singing truth. He is Lord. But the question, Lord, Lord, why do you call me Lord, Lord, not do the things which I say? It hits home. It hits our pride. It hits where it hurts, it challenges us, it convicts us, it locates where we are as believers. It's correction 101, and how many of you here love correction? No one loves correction, but how many of you here believe that correction is good for you? Yes. So this is correction 101, and it's not pleasant. But see, this question was not asked by Jesus to condemn us. It wasn't asked to condemn us. He asked this to help us. So I don't want you to picture Jesus saying, hey, you just sang Lord, Lord. So why do you call me Lord, Lord? You never do what I say. No, no, no. He's saying, okay. So why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? And the reason... He said that is to help us because Proverbs 16, 18 says, we heard this last week, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And God does not want to destroy us. God does not want destruction to come upon us. And last week we heard pride, it is the root of all sin. It is the root cause of all sin. Pride is showing oneself above others, including God himself. That's what happens when we walk in pride. Pride says, I do not need God to tell me what's right or wrong. Pride says, I am above God, and I am above his word, and I can redefine the terms on which I live based on my emotions, my feelings, and my own truth. That's what pride says. And what God is saying, that goes before destruction. And so now he's reaching out to us. See, in the book of Genesis, if we read the book of Genesis, God created two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when he put that there, 
He said, do not partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was forbidden. Why? Because only God can define what's good and what's evil. Only God can define that. And he said, don't partake of that because you shall surely die. And we can see right now, because the world is defining what's good and evil for themselves, what's right and wrong for themselves. We now see death all around, death in some form or shape. We see the society we are in. And do you agree with me? It's so dark outside. It is. And there's, so, there's death in relationships. There's death in finances. There's sickness and disease. All that is going on. And God is saying, no, 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 that is not my plan for you. And so now here we can see what he's saying. When Adam partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it gave Adam and the rest that followed after him the tragic ability to define good and evil for themselves. And that is what's happening today, where people live the way they want to, depending on what feels good at the moment. They want to redefine what God has already defined. There's no boundaries. They, they don't even see the word as a boundary. And we saw what pride did to Adam and Eve. They were thrown out of the garden of Eden. And God does not want destruction for us. And so this message today, which is for all of us, including me, not just some of us, this message is God running after us with this word. That was our first song. He's running after us. He's running after us. When you see we're going the wrong way, he's running after us with this word. This message is the love and compassion of God reaching out to us, all of us. His word today, and let me prepare you for this. His word today is like a surgeon's knife that will cut away that which will kill and destroy us. His word today is biblical love in action it's biblical love in action where god is willing to hurt or offend us for our benefit are we ready for some surgery today yeah because we just we just cleaned out the blood from last service you know i just cleaned out the blood from myself the past you know few weeks that i've been studying this so if you're ready we're gonna make room right or this is OR right now, so here we go, here we go. So the title for my message right now is, Is the Lord your Lord? Is the Lord your Lord? This is the year of testimony. How many of you are waiting for some testimonies to happen? How many of you have some testimonies to happen? Yes, we're waiting for some amazing testimonies. But on the other side of that, remember, we don't just have testimonies, but our desire is that we be a testimony. We be a testimony to the world of what Jesus looks like. Amen? So, what does our testimony as Christians look like to the world? Does the world see a difference between unbelievers and us? Do we look more like the world? Or do we look more like Jesus? So think about this. This room is about more or less a thousand people in this room, all right? And uh, the majority of us here would say that we follow Jesus, amen? Yeah, yeah, we follow Jesus and uh, we love Jesus. So I wonder if, if we could do that and just use your imagination, if we could, all of us here, line up our lives one by one. Let's line up our lives one by one. And then an unbeliever would look at our lives. Would he ask this question? Are you following the same Jesus? <sighs> Selah. When the world looks at us, and our lives are lined up as believers. Would they say, eh, are, are you following the same Jesus? Because we live 
in such an individualistic culture that we think it is our job and our right to define the terms by which we live in. We live such an individualistic culture that we think it is our right even to define what it looks like to follow Jesus. So if I were to take this Bible right now and I would see what Jesus says it looks like to follow him and I will compare it to what we say it looks like to follow him. Would we see a stark difference between what he says and what we say? How's the surgery going? The next few scriptures that I will read is to make it abundantly clear what God's people should look like. Jesus is saying in the next verses, and I'm going to read them to you. If you're going to be a citizen of my kingdom, if you're going to be a true disciple, if you're going to be a true follower, then this is what should be true of you. Now, as I say that, I am not saying that anybody will get this perfect, this side of heaven. Because no one is perfect. No one. When I read, you know, the four things that this is what you should look like, I'm, I'm guaranteeing you right now because like me, I am not 100% there. This is all a journey that we are taking. Amen. So no one is perfect. As I say this, understand. But this is the journey for all of us, not just the some of us. So the context of Luke 6, 46, the first verse I read, is found in Luke 6, 17 to 19. Uh, the other account is found in Matthew chapter 5, which is known as the Beatitudes. So Jesus now comes down into a level plane and he starts teaching people. So let's begin there. Luke 6, 17 to 19 in the Amplified. Then Jesus came down with them, stood in a level place, and there was a large crowd of his disciples and a vast multitude of people from all over Judea and Jerusalem and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon who had come to listen to him. Say listen. And be healed of their diseases. Say, be healed. So listen and be healed. Even those who were troubled by unclean spirits, demons, were being healed. All the people were trying to touch him because healing power was coming from him and healing them all. So now we can see from these verses, okay, four things that are true of followers of Jesus. The first one being followers of Jesus hear from Jesus. So in this crowd, in the account, in Luke chapter 6, we see the disciples. We see people who will follow him for the rest of their lives, other disciples. But also you have in that group of people, uh, those who just came because they just, they just want to hear him. They just heard, oh, you know, he's very popular. Man, you know, I, I, it might be good to hear him. They, they don't necessarily follow him. They're not necessarily his disciples. But you know what? They're part of the crowd. They, they want to hear what he has to say. They've come to hear Jesus. So followers of Jesus hear from Jesus. So what does it look like for us to hear Jesus today? Well, you're here hearing Jesus. Amen. Well, hearing me, but the word. All right. So you're here to hear from God. And this is Sunday. So there are several churches right now who are sitting down hearing from God. And then hopefully, this is not the only time you hear from him. Hopefully, because he has given us his word, how many of you know when God, when you open the Bible, God opens up his mouth? A pastor said that. That's really cool. When you open up your Bible, God opens up his mouth. And when God starts to speak, we listen. We hear. So hopefully in your circles, in your life groups, uh, in places where you gather, there are times when you actually hear from G Jesus in your prayer time every day. So not just on a Sunday. You know what? God has made it. Easy, actually, to hear from him with his word. Amen. And all scripture, all, say all. It has been breathed on by God. This is the very breath of God. This is God's word to us. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that, all right? So, one thing that I would say, if we are here to hear, it's not about completion, but connection. Now, let me explain. Some people, not in this church, but some people here to complete a task. Ooh, I, I, checklist, 
I was there on a Sunday. I'm a good Christian. Check, check, check. Or, okay, I read Bible reading plan, which is good, by the way, if you have a Bible reading plan. But I'm saying just going there to check it. Ooh, check, check. And you know what? At some point in my life, I was like that, you know, because I had a Bible reading plan. And there were times I said, okay, makabasa lang ako na isang chapter. Ooh, check, right? But I want to encourage you. Don't hear from Jesus to complete, but to connect. Connect to the heart of God. Connect so that you grow in your relationship with God. When you come to church, you say, God, okay, I, I want to hear words that are going to make me grow, right? So not completion, but connection, okay? So now, before we move on, that's number one, right? If you look at the people who were in the audience of Jesus, you can see that there were disciples, but there were also just crowds, and maybe, maybe, just maybe lang, you know, it's like that this morning here in New Life. That this room has people who are followers of Christ. They've been coming here, you know, for years and years and years. And, and maybe there are people who just got tricked into coming. Which, kunyari lang, oh, halika lunch tayo, libre kita. Libre kita, oh, game, game. Oh, sige, sunduin kita. Yay, okay, punta muna tayong church, ha? Eh? Oh, sige na nga, may libreng lunch naman. <laughs> I mean, I've heard stories about that. I've heard stories. I mean, these are in their testimonies. Like, oh, a friend brought me to church. I thought we were going out to lunch. It was my first time, but I encountered the Lord. Hallelujah! So, you know, there might be some here. I don't know. You just came to check this church out, and that's okay. But just because someone is hearing from Jesus by reading the Bible or coming to church does not necessarily mean that they are truly followers of Jesus. So we need to go a step further, all right? So we'll go to number two. Followers of Jesus desire to experience Jesus. Yes. So did you see why they came? The verses that I read. It says in verse 18, they came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd, all the crowd, everyone in the crowd, all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. So in attendance are those who are sick, in need of healing, those with unclean spirits. And they have come to Jesus because they wanted to experience his miracle-working power. Right? So they wanted to experience Jesus for themselves. So when I say that, I'm talking about people desiring a first-hand experience. People desiring to have their own God stories. Of how God did something significant. Maybe you're here, you're believing for a financial breakthrough. Maybe you're here, you're believing for your family to get restored. Uh, maybe, you know, you've been praying for a family member to come to the Lord and they're, you know, hard as a rock and you just want to go, oh God, help me, uh, give me wisdom. Oh, so, all across the room, 100% here, we have come with needs. And we have come to experience Jesus. And that's good. It's, that's all good. But the thing is, here... Not everyone in the Bible or everyone that I know who has had an experience with God, like a miracle or being healed, has ever followed Jesus to the end. Not, not everyone. It's sad to say, but, you know, I've seen people, they experience God one time. They're like, hallelujah, they get the breakthrough, and then you don't see them in church anymore. It's like, eh, what happened? You know, oh, they got, the, they got what they wanted. They're like believing, 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 and they experience God. woo -hoo! And then after that, it's like uh, you, you don't see them anymore. So there were people who experienced healing, who never truly followed Jesus to the end, even in the Word. And I tell you, that's what's happening in our society today, not in this church. There are people who boil Christianity down to going to church and praying to God in crisis, but that is not truly following Jesus, so we need to take this a step further. Repeat this after me. This message is for all of us. Not just some of us. Number three, followers of Jesus are transformed by Jesus. This is where the surgeon's knife starts cutting deep. So you have to understand the point of the Sermon of Jesus, the Beatitudes, found in this particular book, the book of Luke, Luke chapter 6. He's doing nothing short of redefining the world. You know, that's your homework. Go and read it. I'm not, I'm going to read some of it. But he's doing nothing short. He's redefining the world. What Jesus is trying to say is this. I'm going to flip the world right now. The world as you see it. The world as you think it is. 
Because if you're going to be my follower, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to be a citizen of heaven, if you're going to be my son and my daughter, then you're going to need to think differently. You're going to have to think the way I think. You're going to have to see things the way I see things. Because my ways are higher. Weren't we singing that? Your way is better. Did we sing that? Did we sing that? I sang that. And I'm going, <laughs> you know, that's how I sang it. Because I already knew what I was going to preach. We say his way is better and we're like, all, oh, oh, but we. And I, that's why I keep saying we. But then when he says, don't do that, this is better. We go, what? Cutting deep surgery. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. Right? Break down the ground. I don't shake up the ground. Oh, this is what he's doing right now. They're shaking. There's breaking. Don't worry about it. I, I'm filleted right now. Because this message was for me first. So what Jesus is doing in this sermon on the mount is inviting people. He's inviting people. He's not coercing people. He's not forcing people. But he's inviting people to adopt an entirely different worldview. His view. And this is what hits our pride. This is what challenges us. Luke 6, 27 to 31. Watch this. This is part of his sermon. Love your enemies. I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. Oh my gosh. Imagine. Ah. Okay, ito pa. Okay, drama to the max, right? To the one who strikes you in the cheek, offer the other also. From one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. From one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Did you just see that? He basically took things that we want to do for those we love. He basically takes the things that it's easy to do to those we care about. It's easy to do to, to our friends. Oh, not even friends. Oh, not all. Close friends. He takes those friends and says, no, you actually do them to those who hate you. You actually do them to your enemies. And this is where the distinction comes in right now. Are we true followers or do we just want to hear and experience Jesus, but not follow him. Why? That's too hard. Ano ba? Tama ba naman yan? Or we don't want to follow him because, that, you know what? That, that does not make sense. But you know what? I've done things when God instructed me to do some things that did not make sense, and his way was better. His way was better. And sometimes we don't want to do it because, I, Lord, are, are you serious? I thought you were a loving God. Yes, he is loving. And that's why he's telling us, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I tell you to do? Followers of Jesus are shaped and transformed by Jesus. And when I say shaped and transformed, I'm talking about his desires becoming our desires. His convictions being shaped, uh, shaping our convictions. His mindset becomes our mindset. His word becomes the absolute authority in our life. Our purpose in life is being shaped by his purpose for us. His truth is now our truth. Are we willing, are we willing to have our belief system, our ideology, our way of thinking, our way of living be challenged by God? Because we call him Lord. Lord, Lord. Because when we say that, then we have to come to a place where we can allow God to challenge us. I think a good question to ask is this. Who 
or what are the biggest shaping forces in our lives right now? Who is the loudest voice in your life? Or what has the loudest voice in our life? What's shaping us? What's transforming us? Is it the news outlet? Is it an influencer? Is it social media? Is it a pastor? Whatever it is, whatever. We need to evaluate, is it the way of Jesus? Is what is transforming us, is what is shaping us, the way of Jesus, the word of Jesus? Because if it doesn't line up with what we find in the Bible, we have found the wrong way and we have found the wrong shaping force. Romans 12, 1 to 2, Amplified Classic. The Apostle Paul wrote these men. And the Apostle Paul, before he was called Paul, he was called Saul. And Saul, before his conversion, thought he was being a true follower of Jesus by persecuting Christians. He thought he was doing God a favor, and God had to encounter him in the road of Damascus so that he fell from his high horse. And some of us here, if not all of us here, we need to fall from our high horse of pride and say, God, you know what? I don't know anything, but you know everything. And Saul had to be brought down by God. And he, God said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You're kicking against the goats. What's he saying? You're going against my word. You're going against what I want. It is hard for you to kick against that. And it is the same Apostle Paul in the book of Romans. Romans 12, 1 to 2. In the Amplified Classic, he says, I appeal to you. Appeal. Like I said, this is God's message of love and compassion for all of us i appeal to you therefore brethren my brothers and sisters and beg of you in view of all the mercies of god in view of his love for you in view of all that he has done for you to make a decisive dedication of your bodies decisive intentional dedication of your bodies presenting all your members and faculties including your thinking, not just your body, but your mind as a living sacrifice. Oh, yes, it's going to be a sacrifice. It's never easy to lay down what's dear to us. It's never easy to lay down what we thought was right. And oh, hindi pala. And you lay down. It's never easy. But he says, as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable. I'm thinking, wow, this is your normal reasonable response that's what the bible is saying that's what apostle paul is saying which is your reasonable rational intelligent service and spiritual worship do not be conformed to this world this age fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs and that is what we see going around the world right now the world is speaking to us. This is the culture you must live by. This is the truth you must live by. These are the things you must walk in to be accepted, to be loved. And you know what the Bible says? It says, don't be conformed to it. The message Bible, that, that, that part, do not be conformed, says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. And that's what's going on right now. That's where the deception is. The world is trying to normalize what the Bible already calls sin. And we're fitting into a culture without even thinking. And God is saying, no, he's running after us. Because you know why this message is for all of us and not just some of us? Because he loves all of us and not just some of us. It's his love in action. Amen. It's glory to God. And so he says, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind. Not just some, the entire renewal of your mind by its new ideals, its new attitude. 
so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good, acceptable, perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. I want the good. I want the acceptable. I want the perfect will of God for my lives. Don't, for my life. Don't you? Don't you? We want that. I, I believe that's why we're all here, to be taught of God, all of us including me. I, I love what Pastor Stephen said last week. We are a museum. This is a museum of broken people. We're all broken. We're in need, you know, of healing, all of us. In our struggles, in our anxieties, everything, we are. But the love of God is here. And he's saying, I want the good, I want the acceptable, and I want the perfect will for you. And I'm not talking about some external force that's trying to change us, okay? I am talking about God himself wanting to come into your life to shape us. An internal force, not an outside force, an internal force. The Spirit of God changing us, transforming us. That's what I'm talking about. Where we allow, because he is Lord, the Spirit of God to shape us according to the life of Jesus Christ. And the best thing we can do is surrender to it. And that's number four. Followers of Jesus live fully surrendered to Jesus. And when I say that, again, this is a journey. Amen. A journey that all of us take. So here comes our loaded question now. If we live our lives fully surrendered to Jesus, look at what Jesus says. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Jesus knows that it cannot be so that he is my Lord if I choose to do my own thing. It cannot be so that he is my Lord if I just want him to affirm my beliefs or my lifestyle or the way I act or the way I think. If I call him Lord, that means he has power and authority over my life. See, when we all hear, well, maybe 90% of us, when we accepted Jesus as Christ our Savior, it involved a recognition of his lordship because the savior who saved us when we received him by faith is called the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who he is. That's who we received as savior. We cannot and do not receive him as savior only. We receive him as Lord and savior. And yielding to this process Yielding to this process. Because how many of you know, saving, how many of you know we're all saved? We're going to heaven. Yes. Because we're saved. But this lordship, this yielding, this submission, it's a process. It's a process that all of us go through. Some, it's a few months later. Some, it's years later. But it's a process that we submit to if he's truly the Lord of our life. Some instantaneous changes happen. Some change happens for months and even years. But the thing is this, are you yielded to the process? Because you know, like when I became born again, okay, before I was born again, before I knew Jesus, I, my gosh, the way I spoke, I was like cuss words were going out of my mouth like, <laughs> I mean, I wasn't even angry. But if you would put like on social media, it would be beep, da -da -da -da, beep, beep, da -da -da -da. Because of all the bad words that would come out of my mouth. These are cuss words. They were normal to me. I'd be like, ha, 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 Seriously. My, my, I mean, you know how he's like, I'm going to rinse your mouth with soap? You know, because you have a dirty mouth? I had that. It was, ugh. But anyway, what happened was, because when I received Jesus as Lord and Savior, so I was still doing that, it was instantaneous for me. I couldn't, I couldn't, it, I couldn't. I'd be like, nothing. So in that respect, that area of my life where I would just, you know, say dirty words, you know, and all that, that disappeared instantly, instantly. Now, the other areas of my life, I'm still working on. I'm still working on saying sorry to my husband when I'm wrong. I seriously am. And uh, God filleted me for that. Because here I am going, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And he goes, uh, <clears throat> why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not apologize to your husband when you know you're wrong? There is some celebration here in the front row. 
I'm telling you, this is a message for all of us, honey, including you. You're preaching next week, so you better. Uh. No, but, but you, do you see what I'm saying? This lordship is a process. And there are other things in my life that I'm still laying down, that I'm still, uh, uh, what? I'm not supposed to do that. My son is here. He's going to attest to that. You know? Like, oh, my God, Mom, what was that? I mean, my son even corrects me. So there are areas in our life where we truly submit to the process of his being Lord. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, amplified. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have received as a gift from God, and you are not your own property? You were bought with a price. You were actually purchased with the precious blood of Jesus and made his own. So then, honor and glorify God with your body. Oh, someone said this, unless Jesus is Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. Ow! Anybody bleeding in this place right now? Because this is a challenge to all Christians to bring every area, every area of our lives under the sovereign rule of Jesus Christ. Because when we receive him as Lord and Savior, we acknowledge his ownership. And guess what? We give up personal rights. We give up our right to live the way we want to, talk the way we want to, act the way we want to, think the way we want to. We give that up. Why? Because we surrender everything to him. And this is what our journey is all about because no one is perfect. And everyone has their own stories and struggles, but we journey with them. This is why we have church. This is why we're so big on community. This is why we're big on life groups because nobody can go through that alone. Nobody can go through their struggle alone. People are drowning out there. And, we, and you know what? And I'll, you know, I, I say this. Imperfect people are preaching a perfect gospel. Because I certainly am not perfect, but he is. And he is who we journey with, along with others. In our lives, there should be no rivalry for his throne. No mindset, no ideology, no belief system, no attitude should be rival to his throne. It doesn't make sense for us to say you're Lord and it's just choose to live the way we want to. It does not make sense. It's good to remember that Jesus is never just Savior. Jesus is always Lord at the exact same time. But the problem is we want a Savior, but we don't always want a King. We want a Savior but we don't always want a king, and that's pride. That's pride. To be a true follower of Jesus is to live under the lordship of Jesus. It's to live a life surrendered to Jesus. It's to live a life of full obedience to Jesus. It's believing that partial obedience, selective obedience, delayed obedience is still disobedience. Seriously, surgery right here. Are we willing to let go of sins that so easily ensnare us? Our beliefs, unforgiveness, offense, are we willing to surrender that? Jesus shows how much he cares about us and loves us in verses 47 to 49. He shows us an illustration here. He said, everyone who comes to me and listens to my words and obeys them, I will show you whom he is like. He's like a far-sighted, practical, and sensible man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and yet could not shake it because it had been securely built and founded on the rock. But the one who has merely heard and has not practiced what I say is like a foolish man who built a house on the ground without any foundation. And the torrent burst against it, and it immediately collapsed, and the ruin of the house was great. God does not want us to be in ruin. 
So tell me, which is the normal way? What's the normal way to build a house? If somebody came up to you and say, hey, I'm building a house, but I'm foregoing the foundation. You're going to go, huh? What? Uh, what? That doesn't make sense, right? Because the normal thing is to build a house with the right foundation. The normal thing for a Christian life is to have a surrendered life. That's the normal. Again, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's comfortable. I'm saying it is a journey, but I'm saying God is with us. See, in the eyes of Jesus, information without application, it's crazy. It makes no sense to him. And it grieves the Holy Spirit when he sees our lives being built on shaky ground. No foundation. And you know where it will be seen? The clear divergence in the quality of life of those who obey his word and those who do not is only seen when storms come. It's seen when storms come. Because it says when the storms come, that's where we will see the difference. So God is saying, let go of your pride. Saying to me, Mylene, let go of your pride. It stands in the way of our relationship with God. Sin has been dealt with. That's what we heard last week. Sin has been dealt with. The price has been paid. The problem is not sin. The problem is pride. Sin is not in the way. <laughs> Can you imagine? Pride is. And we cannot access everything that God has for us unless we bow down in humility and let go of our pride. How many of you love Psalm 23? Can somebody shout out the first verse of Psalm 23? The who? Oh, the Savior is my shepherd? Uh, the Father is my shepherd? And he is Father and he is Savior. But Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd. And because he's my shepherd, because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. You don't lack because you make him Lord. You lie down in green pastures because he is Lord. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow us because he is Lord. Not just Savior. Let's not go through Psalm 23 like, you know, we surely goodness and mercy will come running, running, and all of a sudden, yeah, running, run, yeah, running. And it's good, right? But what's the context? It's running after us because he is Lord. Hallelujah. There's a church in the book. It's the, it was called the Corinthian Church. And the book of 1 Corinthians was written as a letter of correction. Because in the book of Corinthians, the people in the church of the church of Corinth, it was filled with people who were born again. They were born again. They received Jesus as Savior but did not live like he was Lord. So 1 Corinthians is actually a letter of correction. The Apostle Paul, he was responding to issues in the church. It was written to a people who were staunch individualists. All right? And they, and they reflected their individualism by the way they lived their lives. And you know what? They also, you know, accommodated this gospel to make it palatable to their culture. And that's what's going on right now. The woke culture, I say it's not in this house, where they take the Word of God and they read the Word of God to make it fit into their culture. No, our culture must align with this Word because He is Lord. Amen. So we're not going to be a church that's a woke church. We are not going to accommodate the gospel to make it palatable to our culture and our mindset. No. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. And as I read this, again, he was reading it to the church. He was not reading it to the world. He was reading it to a church of born-again believers. And I'll read it in the Passion Translation. We don't usually uh, use this translation, but for this particular one, I, I just like how it's worded here. It says, surely, believers, <laughs> you must know that people who practice evil cannot possess God's kingdom realm. The New King James says the unrighteous cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Then he starts listing down the behavior of the unrighteous. 
Stop being deceived. People who continue, continue, all right? Bear with me. People who continue to engage in sexual immorality, idolatry, adultery, sexual perversion, homosexuality, fraud, greed, drunkenness, verbal abuse, or extortion. These will not inherit God's kingdom realm. Then he says, it's true that some of you once lived in those lifestyles. It's true. Some of you once lived. But now, say, but now. But now, believers, you have been purified from sin. You have been made holy. You have been given a perfect standing before God. If you're a believer, if you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, you've been given right standing before God, all because of the power of the name of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, and through our union with the Spirit of our God. The Apostle Paul was preaching a message of love. He was saying, wait a minute. You're born again. Sin is not your identity anymore. That's your old identity. You are a new creation in Christ. So live it out. You've already been cleansed. Live it out. Don't use your freedom to do things that once led to eternal punishment. Why are you doing the things that unrighteous people do when you've already been made righteous? Why identify yourselves with these when you can identify with me and my word. See, in, 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 in Corinth, some of them were used to be known by these labels because of their sin. But the Apostle Paul is saying, no, you are now in Christ. And because you are in Christ, stop doing any of these sins because it will destroy your life. Destruction. Your house falling in ruin. And maybe some of you here are thinking, oh, I don't do those things. I don't do those things. Well, think again. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Let me read this. The cravings of the self-life or the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, pornography, chasing after things instead of God, manipulating others, Hatred of those who get in your way. Senseless arguments. Hello, husband and wives. Resentment when others are favored. Temper tantrums. Angry quarrels. Only thinking of yourself. Anybody bleeding right now? Come on. Being in love with your own opinions. Being envious of the blessings of others. Murder, uncontrolled addictions, wild parties, and all other similar behavior. I told you, this is a message for all of us. Because 100%, you can find a struggle here. Unless you're perfect. And unless you're Jesus. All of us are here. Haven't I already warned you that those who use their freedom for these things will not inherit the kingdom realm of God? But, say but... So now here's the Apostle Paul, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which His presence within accomplishes is love, joy, gladness, peace, patience, and even temper, forbearance, kindness, goodness, benevolence, help us Jesus, faithfulness, gentleness, meekness, humility, self-control, self-restraint, continence. This is surrender. <laughs> Against such things, there is no law that can bring a charge. And those who belong to Christ Jesus, the Messiah. How many of you here, you belong to Christ Jesus? You know it. You, yes. Those of us who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, the godless human nature with its passions and appetites and desires. Everything, everything, at one point or another, we've struggled with it. We're still struggling with it. But you know what God is saying? No, surrender it. To the Holy Spirit, you can. If we live by the Holy Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. If by the Holy Spirit, we have our life in God, let us go forward walking in line, our conduct controlled by the Spirit. All of us are here. See, it's so easy to judge a sin that you are not struggling with. Right? Oh, Kita mo yan, grabe naman. Oh, wow. Oh, my. Oh, my. 
hello, uh, don't remove the speck in your brother's eye because you actually have a plank in your eye. Isn't that what the Bible says? So this, this is not me. This is the word of God. I mean, I've been sewing planks from my eyes. I have. Because again, you will find every one of us here in this list right now. And our part as a church and as a community is to help one another walk the journey, is to help one another understand their journey, their backstories, and help them live a full life, a victorious life, a surrendered life, a life that will not come to ruin and destruction. Because God loves all of us, not just some of us. What in your life has Jesus spoken about explicitly and you're like, I just don't feel convicted about that. Well, just because we don't feel convicted doesn't mean we shouldn't. Because the problem is not with Jesus' command. The problem is with our heart. The problem is pride. All across this room, there's a lot of us who have an area or two that God wants us free from. So what in your life is Jesus looking at? And I've asked this question myself so many times in the course of just meditating and reading. What in your life is Jesus looking at all across this room? Let me ask you. And saying, hey, my son, my daughter, why do you call me Lord, Lord? And yet you fill in the blanks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And yet you still do these things. What is it? If you're struggling or have any questions or don't see why it's a sin with any of these things that I just mentioned, this is why we have church. So we can journey and walk together and help one another grow in maturity. Because the church is not here to condemn. But the church is not here to compromise either. We understand that everyone is in a journey in their walk with the Lord, and no one sin is greater than the rest. But I will say this, the consequences of a sin can be greater than the rest. So let's not stop at being just hearers and experienced seekers. Let's truly allow the Lord to shape us and transform us and yield and submit and surrender and say yes to this process, this process of sanctification that we are all in as sons and daughters of God. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself, disregard, lose sight of, and forget himself and his own interests. Wow. And take up his cross and follow me. Cleave steadfastly to me. Conform wholly to my example in living. And if need be, in dying also. <laughs> because there is a cost to following Jesus. When we follow Jesus and his word, we will face persecution. We will be canceled out. We will be misunderstood. We might lose our followers on social media. <laughs> but I do not think it will ever be greater than the cost and the price that Jesus paid for our salvation. If the Christian has settled the lordship issue, which I pray, which I pray this would be the beginning of that journey or this would be the start where we say, Jesus, I settle in my heart. You are my Lord. And if that means me going through a process, so be it, God. Because if we have settled the lordship issue, then all other issues in our life are also settled. And there might be a struggle, and it might be uncomfortable in the journey, but our heart is settled. Can I just read this, all right? Because we've had so many people, messages on social media, asking for clarification, questions. So let, let me just read this. Anyone is welcome in the church. 
anyone, I don't care who you are, you're welcome. From any background, from any mindset, whatever it is, come. You're welcome in the church. You're welcome to worship. You're, come, you're welcome to come and hear about Jesus. We will not turn anyone away because Jesus never turned anyone away. I don't care who you are on site, online, you are welcome in this house. You are. We are called to love people from all walks of life. But as a church, we do not change the Bible and what we preach to fit our culture, to be accepted by our culture, or to be loved by our culture. We do not want to be applauded by a culture that is under the influence of the enemy. The church does not exist to please people. It exists as the pillar and ground of truth, and that truth is found in the Word of God. And that is our mandate as a church. It is to preach the unadulterated Word of God, which is the truth, and to love people with compassion and grace and mercy. True followers of Jesus prioritize hearing from Jesus. They desire to experience Jesus. They're shaped by Jesus, and they live fully surrendered to Jesus. I want to, right now in this place, with every head bowed, every eye closed, just very quickly, no looking around. If you listen to this message and you are saying, and just be honest, all right? Nobody's looking at you. This is between you and God, and you're saying, Pastor, you know what? There are areas in my life I need to lay down. There are things in my life that's bringing me down right now, and I don't want to go into ruin, and I want to surrender that right now. And it might be a process. It might be a long journey, but I make a decision right now to lay that at the feet of Jesus. If you're struggling with any of these things right now, I want to pray for you. So if you could lift your hands right where you are, just lift your hands. Hey, Pastor, oh, oh, I'm going, I see the hands lifted up all over the place. If you're going through a struggle with, maybe you have anger issues, I don't know. <sighs> see hands all over the place. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just, I just pray for us. <laughs> Because I have some things too in my life that I need to lay down and I need to put under your lordship. But God, I thank you that you are patient and you're loving and you're kind and you love us. And I thank you that as I lay this down at your feet and I say, not my will, God, but yours be done. I thank you for the empowerment to live out a life that is pleasing to you. I thank you, God. And from this day on, this will be my journey with you and the church that you have put me in, in Jesus' name. Another thing, if you're in this place, maybe it's your first time, maybe it's not, but you've never made that decision for Jesus to be Lord of your life, Savior and Lord, I want to give that invitation again today. Jesus loves you so much, and he wants your house to be standing on solid ground, and that solid ground is having Jesus in your life as Lord and Savior. And so again, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you are this person that says, you know what, Pastor? I want to give my life to Jesus. I need him. I need him. I really need him in my life. And I believe that he died for me. I believe that he paid the penalty for my sin. I believe him. So, Pastor, I need Jesus. If that's you right now, raise your hands again where you are, and I'll pray for you. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for those hands. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. Thank you. I see those hands. You may put those hands down. For those of you who just raise your hands to receive Jesus Christ and Lord and Savior, I want you to pray this prayer after me. This is a prayer from your heart, all right? And congregation, I want us to pray this prayer with those who are going to pray it for the first time. Jesus... I thank you for dying for me, for giving your life for me, for loving me. Today, I make the decision for you to be Lord of my life. Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. 
my King and my Lord, today. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for me. I thank you for the Holy Spirit that will be with me all my life in this journey with you. In your name I pray. Amen and amen. Amen.